this is, I, I see the uh, New Mexico lunchtime fair has affected all of us, so uh, would y'all like to hear a Mike Suffredini joke? Yes. yes. I thought it'd be perfect uh, for this conference mainly because Mike is not here. Um, we were having an argument, you know, I worked for NASA for, for a long time now, I worked for Boeing. And we were having an argument about the relative security of civil service jobs versus contractor jobs. And Mike says, you know, John, there's really no comparison whatsoever. Anybody on my team can walk in, pound that table and say, Mike, I do not like the way you're running this program. I said, well, Mike, you know, it's exactly the same with me. Anybody on my team can come in, pound my desk, and say, I do not like the way that Mike is running that program. <laughs> so, Mike is doing a great job. Mike and his entire team are doing a fantastic job. But what we're seeing is a change in the ISS. Uh, another transformation from what it was to what we all hope that it will be, and that's more of a commercial platform. And we're seeing the changes. We'll see them over the next year. Uh, we saw a little bit of it today. Um, I'm extremely excited right now. I'm very, very hyped because uh, we did an EVA this morning. And uh, Reed Wiseman, Butch Wilmore went out for the first time in space, and they did a very complicated spacewalk uh, we swapped out something called a sequential shunt unit, which is a box that is sitting at the base of a solar array. So the astronauts had to go all the way out to the, close to the end of the truss to a box that sits there, and it, it's like a voltage regulator for, for one of the electrical systems on, uh, on ISS, one of the power channels. And uh, they had to drive one bolt out, pull this out, drive a, another bolt, put the, put the new one in. It sounds simple, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and you think about it, it's kind of hard to turn solar arrays off, so you've got charge in solar arrays if you're in the sun. So the crew set up and, uh, and uh, was all ready to go, and as soon as, uh, as we hit eclipse and, and the station went dark, uh, they were able to, to do that job, did a terrific job. The new one is working really good, and they're going to start putting loads on it uh, tomorrow. And uh, they did that. Then they went and did some other cleanups, some stanchions, some, uh, uh, some cameras that will help us do dockings with... Uh, commercial cargo vehicles and, uh, and eventually commercial crew vehicles. So outstanding EVA. While we were all out there eating cake, the crew was coming in, repressed the airlock, and it all went great. Um, I want to talk about ISS benefits. And this is going to have the flavor of why ISS is really our focal point in LEO. And I think right now it is really our focal point for exploration. And uh, if we are ever going to do anything as, a, as the larger community in exploration, we have got to use ISS, and hopefully I will bring some examples to you uh, that explain what the true value of ISS has been for exploration. We'll talk about why commercial crew cargo is a very, very good thing for this entire uh, team out here, why the international partnerships are important. I'll talk about STEM a bit. And then one of my favorite things is, it's just kind of my mental model of commercial versus government and spheres of influence. All right, so we did the EVA today. It went great. Uh, there's going to be a series of 10 EVAs over the next year where crews will go out, and they're going to completely reconfigure the USOS side of the station. We're going to take that big garage that we took up on the shuttle, the, uh, the uh, PMM, and we're going to move it to a different spot, the place where the shuttle used to dock. We're going to replace that with an international docking adapter. Uh, we're going to put another one up on the top. We've got to run all the wiring and all the cooling and all the data and all that stuff. It's a, it's a very extensive reconfiguration, but the reconfiguration is specifically so you can get two different commercial vehicles, different cargo vehicles coming and going to the station. And I think when, you th when I'm going to tell you later about the traffic model of ISS, it's, it's amazing what we're doing now uh, with the station as far as a commercial standpoint. Year-long increment begins in April. Uh, Scott Kelly, Mikhail Kornienko are going to go up and spend a year. That's an exploration activity. Beam, we just talked about the Bigelow uh, expandable activity module, I think is what Beam is for. Uh, so we'll do an inflatable on ISS. And Suff's direction to, uh, to the entire team is that we have got to be ready with the docking adapters and the communication systems and, and everything uh, that commercial crew and commercial uh, cargo, which we're already doing, need uh, to be able to start in 2016. So the station will be reconfigured by that time. Uh, let's talk, uh, I guess I'm in control. 
Okay, when we talk about science, I, I want to talk about science a little bit. There's over 200 uh, experiments going on. I think ISS gets a bad rap sometimes because people count up crew hours and they never count up all of the thousands of hours that are going on with researchers and scientists down on the ground that are getting their data uh, remotely from the ISS. So there's a tremendous amount of science going on. But I want to talk to you about some new stuff, right? We always talk about protein crystal growth and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and all those are really good, but I think this, this group has probably heard most of them. Um, this last weekend, we did our first rodent science on ISS. And these are genetically modified mice. They're all the same. Uh, what they're doing is trying to understand muscle atrophy. Uh, they have a specific uh, gene missing that causes that muscle atrophy. They take a look at it. This was, uh, I think this was our casus mice. If Dwayne's still here. This was our casus mice that we used for this. Um, so it's doing an experiment that in life sciences um, that will allow you to look for protein markers for muscle loss. And of course for exploration you're interested in that because you want astronauts that have good muscle tone whenever they get to Mars or any other long duration kind of mission. But it also helps you back on Earth because there's lots of diseases like aging, which I think is a disease, that cause muscle loss. And if you can find the protein markers, then you can start to develop uh, countermeasures to it. From the Earth Sciences standpoint, the first Earth Sciences experiment on the Columbus uh, exposed facility, rapid scat, it's a scatterometer. It looks at, uh, at wind direction, wind speed of, over the oceans. And it helps you with uh, weather prediction, hurricane prediction, but really what it's good is ISS goes over the most active parts of the Earth, and there are other scatterometers that uh, measure basically the same type of thing. You can calibrate those with the, uh, with the ISS rapid scat. They already got a tremendous amount of data from it, and it, they just basically turned it on. Um, it's the first of, we're going to have six Earth observation uh, experiments outside of Columbus. The next one is called CATS. It has nothing to do with the mice that I just talked about. Uh, the CATS is a cloud aerosol transport um, experiment. It's just looking at particulate matter in clouds, where clouds form, the smoke, so things like that. So we're doing earth sciences from ISS, which is really important. Um, laser com experiment, it's opals. Everybody hear of opals? We're actually doing laser com. And uh, it's, a, it's a really neat system where it has to match up exactly with the ground point. When it does, it sends a uh, laser communication. And they sent this Hello World video that if we would have sent it down with normal ISS comm systems, it would have taken about 10 minutes, and it took about three and a half seconds to do. And that's important for us to get that big bandwidth that we want to get if we do cislunar or Mars activities. Um, so that's, a, that's an exploration demo, but also has terrestrial applications. And I, I almost didn't put this last one on here. Dr. Ting uh, should be up here explaining this. Um, I do watch Big Bang Theory, but I am not Sheldon. Uh, but particle physics, uh, in the AMS Science was uh, published in uh, the Physical Review Letters, which I am told is a, a uh, extremely prestigious uh, journal that is, um, uh, that is referenced many times by particle physicists. And, uh, and what they talk about is that the AMS may be on the verge of, of finding uh, hypothetical dark matter particles. If you ask a question about that, I will have to go to more soft jokes, so please do not. Uh, do that. All right, let's go to the next chart. Well, wait, wait a minute. You know, so think about what you're doing here, right? Is ISS isn't a one-trick pony at all, right? You've got life sciences, you've got earth sciences, you've got exploration uh, technology demos, and then you've got particle physics. I mean, how can you have a different uh, set of, uh, of results that are coming down from one platform uh, than that? Let's talk about uh, exploration. Um, and I, I truly believe this, that the ISS uh, is really the test bed, right? We are, we are so blessed to have a test bed like ISS where we can really look at four areas of, uh, of exploration systems. And we can do those tech demos like we did with Opal, but also I think just as important is you can look at the maturity and readiness of critical exploration systems. Make sure, you know, when we have done ISS, how far away are we from, from returning a crew? Two hours, right, at most. When we go out to cislunar space, how far are we? You're about eight days if you're in a, in a distant retrograde orbit or in a halo orbit around a Lagrange point. When you're at Mars, you're anywhere from five months to, to a year plus. Your systems have to work, right? And these are all closed loop systems. And these are all closed loop systems in space. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of why it's important to test those on ISS. 
The uh, third thing I think that we get out of, uh, out of ISS for exploration is human health management. We're going to start to see that when we send uh, Scott up. And, uh, and the fourth is that you do uh, operational simulations and techniques. You can do things like Dexter and Robonaut, uh, man-machine interfaces that you would like to do uh, when, you're, when you're further from Earth and you don't want to send crews outside. Let me give you some recent examples. Um, and these are all, well, the first two are about closed loop life support. What's the, what's the uh, most important thing? There's probably a lot of answers to this. What's the most important thing, though, to get up into space? Besides crew? It's water, right? And you could say air. Well, okay, you need air for sure, right? But we use water on ISS for four different things. It's potable water, of course, to drink, right? We break it down in the uh, oxygen generator into oxygen for the crew to breathe. We use it to flush the toilet, it's important. Uh, and we use it for experiments as well. And um, it is expensive because water weighs a lot to get it up to ISS, so you want to reclaim all the water you can. And you can just imagine when you go into exploration, uh, if you're off in the, in the lunar region or if you're off on a trip to Mars, you really don't want to have to take a whole bunch of water, you want to recapture that water. Uh, and so all those things are being tested on ISS. And we learned something um, in the last couple of years about the water processing system, and these closed loop water systems. And uh, it's, there's something called siloxanes, and there's actually a, a big chemical word in front of siloxane, but it's just a group of different chemicals. And do you ever walk into a, um, like an auto repair garage and you smell that garage smell, the grease smell? Um, that's siloxanes. Uh, they are ubiquitous. They are all over the place. They're in hygiene, uh, deodorant. They're in soap. They're in, they're in a lot of different things. When we flew the shuttle for a couple weeks at a time, we did grab samples and stuff. We didn't really know that these siloxane groups were out there. And uh, what we've seen, though, on ISS is that you start to have uh, an accumulation of these siloxanes that do two things, both of which are bad. It's not hazardous to the crew, but it is registered in an organic counter um, as an organosilicate. And the problem with that is that um, as you get more and more and more of these things in your water, it hides what could be more toxic organic particles out there. Um, the other piece of it that is bad is these siloxanes in the water, they affect the chemistry of some of the different systems that we have. They'll take hydrophilic coatings and degrade them so that your systems are not working as well. And that's, uh, it was very frustrating to figure out where in the world are you getting siloxanes, and the answer was everywhere. And then how is it affecting the system? The way the team saw it is they looked at this total organic count they were getting, and they saw it going up, but they couldn't figure out why, because it didn't seem like anything was in the water. Then they found this DMSD in the water, which is another really long chemical word. Now, would we have ever known that without having a closed loop water system on ISS over a long period of time. The bad time to find that is halfway to Mars, right? That you've got some system that's really degrading your onboard water recovery system and you can't do anything about it. But since we have ISS, we can fly up ion reactors and all kinds of things that are able to scrub this out and make the water so it's just fine. The second one is the UPA. I had some, for some reason, I couldn't write urine in this, right? But this was a urine processing assembly. That's part of the water that you're recovering. And uh, the UPA will take um, humidity from the air. Uh, it'll take wastewater. Uh, and what it does is it uses a little uh, rotating reactor to distill out the water. And the way that kind of works, and this is just the, the John Shannon basic thing, is you've got this, this uh, pump that's really spinning fast and you lower the pressure on it and you heat it up at the same time. And what that does is it draws the water out and you, you get a concentrated brine that's left over that you, that you get rid of. And on ground tests, they were able to get about 85% of the water back from all that waste. And so when we first went into ISS with the UPA, we thought, hey, we're gonna get 85% of the water back. And that's how the models were developed uh, we're going to get all that water. It's going to be good. And the problem is if you don't get that water and you get particulate matter coming out, and that particulate matter ruins your, your rotating uh, distiller. Uh, what we actually found, and who would have guessed this, 
is that urine in space is different than urine on the ground. He was, te I know, write that down, that's important. Um, and it actually is important, right? You gotta know this stuff. And what they found out is when they had tests on the ground, they could get that 85% of the water out. When they did a test up on ISS the first time, they got about 70-ish percent of water out before you started to get the, uh, the precipitate inside that pump and it fouled the pump. And what that precipitate was was gypsum. Where the hell does gypsum come from, right? Gypsum is a mix of calcium and sulfate. The sulfur is coming from the pretreat they put into the tank. It's basically sulfuric acid, right? Where's the calcium coming from? Bones, yeah. Who would have thought that? Luckily, when we were peeing, our bones are not eroding out, or at least not, not much, I, I hope. Uh, but on orbit, it, it's accelerated. It's a much more significant thing. And uh, that was, I think, a surprise when they first brought the, the, uh, the first uh, distiller down and opened it up, and it had all this white powder in it. So you gotta find those things out. 70%, think about that if you had headed off to Mars and you had your, your water balance and your, your system was all set up, but then you're only able to recover 70 instead of 85% of your system. Or you, you frag your system, right, because you've put this precipitate in it. The last one that I'll, I'll just go over real quickly is when Luca Parmitano went out and he did the, uh, the EVA. You guys know all this, right? He, he got the water in his helmet. Who would have ever expected that, that this little bitty tiny pump that was rotating really fast, if it got silica particles in it because the water uh, wasn't exactly as pure as we thought it would, that those little particles would, would block all the orifices and then capillary action would pull that water up and it would come out where the O2 was supposed to be coming out behind his head. You could never get that in the in ground test. That, would, that wouldn't happen. Um, so it's been a very good job by the team to figure out what exactly happened. But now we've got the question, and, and Gerst actually gave the, the action item at, a, at a, one of the big meetings, was what other things have we not thought about that we tested it in 1G, but it has a different behavior in a failure case in 0G, which is a very hard, by the way, Gerst, that's a very hard question to answer. I think part of the answer is you go fly on ISS for a while and you test your systems and you stress them and you figure out what breaks and then you bring it back and then you, you, you do the TT and E on it and you understand you go, you go rebuild it. That's my best answer. But if we can figure out other ways to test on the ground, of course, that's much more, uh, much more useful from a, from a cost standpoint. The other thing that I think is really important about ISS uh, from an exploration standpoint is we're finally, I think, as, uh, as an international community able to develop standards right, that I cannot think of anything that would be more in the way of um, having useful international partnerships to go do exploration than not having standards, right? And if you looked at the Apollo-Soyuz mission and the thing between them, right, that's because there weren't the same standards, which you can understand, between the United States and Russia at the time. Um, but now we have a docking system that was originally uh, envisioned, designed by the engineering folks out at Johnson Space Center. Uh, they handed it over to Boeing, and Boeing is, we're building it, we're testing it. There is nothing Boeing proprietary about it. When we're done, we hand the drawings over to NASA, poof, here you go, and anybody can go build that. So that if you want to have a spacecraft that's going to go dock with the ISS, or if we're in exploration, you want spacecraft to dock with each other, Here's your docking system. I have actually have a picture of it on the next thing. I don't know if I can run it from this thing. This was one of the tests that we ran out of the JSC Building 9, Six Degree of Freedom Lab. Can you do that? Oh, there you go. This is a horrible pilot. We need new astronauts, right? It's yawed off five degrees, and it's off by almost four and a half inches. And as soon as you get contact, whoop, goes over and grabs it, clunk, and then pulls it right in. And you've got an active and a passive latch on both the uh, on both sides of the interface, so if you had two actives, you can dock them together, you just have one go passive, or if you have an IDA like we're gonna have on ISS, then you can do the same kind of thing. I've got a computer full of uh, these kind of tests, and, uh, and it's going extremely well. The, uh, the testing, I, I feel like we have a very robust system that we'll be able to deliver to NASA uh, next year. And we're gonna fly those IDAs up in, uh, I think it's February and summertime, August-ish. I don't know, we have to, I have to look at it. All right, so my next test to wake you guys up. 
You saw the good docking thing. All right, all right. I, this is the complete wrong thing to do with this group, right? Because you guys know all this stuff, right? Um, but my 11-year-old, Sarah Beth, and I sat at the table and tried to figure out how many orbital launches went off worldwide last year. And we got to, we got to 81, and two of them didn't work, so we only put 79. Is that about right, you guys? That, Jeff, you probably know? Yeah, that's about right. Okay. How many of those in last year of the 79 orbital went to ISS? And so far in 2014, my daughter and I, we could find 61. There's, of course, a couple more months to go, so we'll have more. How many to ISS and how many to go? And then in 15, how many, how many to go? And then the, the big question at the bottom is the important one, right? Is how many launches, orbital launches in a year are going to ISS? Or what percentage? Anybody want to guess? You guys are so smart, right? Guesses? You can hold it. 10? 10? 10? 10? 15? I wish I had something to give to you, because it's right. Um, so last year, 79 successful orbital launches, 12 went to ISS, 61 so far, about 14. We got 15 next year, right? And it's, it's just clicking up. So think about that, that between 15 and 20% of all orbital launches in a year are going to ISS. If ISS wasn't there, would, would those launches occur? I don't think they would, right? And, and you had a great comment, right, and, and, and Brett did too, right, that we've developed new systems, right? Would Antares exist? Would, this, would the SpaceX systems exist? Would CST-100 exist? Uh, if it wasn't for ISS, and I say no. And so this gives you a capability. Now, why is this a good thing? It's a good thing for, for really two reasons. One is it gives you more launch opportunities so you can ring out your systems, but also you're spreading the rates out across a, a wider group of, of customers. So you can overall reduce the price. If you're just flying you know, one, it's, it's more expensive than if you're flying a bunch more. I thought that was amazing that, uh, that 15 to 20% of all orbital launches in a year just go to service ISS. So we, we created that new market. And, uh, and that's where I think that the, uh, the ISS really has, uh, has provided a significant benefit um, because it's just the things I said. You know, as you get those new innovations, new kind of things, this one is near and dear to me, right, is it trains a new generation of rocket and spacecraft builders. And I got to tell you, I graduated from A&M in 87, and I went to go work on shuttle, and it is very hard uh, to think of a lot of different significant rocket and spacecraft programs that were going on at that time, right? But now look at it. Holy cow, right? There's stuff everywhere. And as uh, my two oldest boys are both... Uh, both engineering students, and uh, that's very, I think it's very important. All right, reduce overall cost, talked about that, redundant access in the case of an accident. That was one of the problems with shuttle, right, is if you had an accident, you're two and a half years down. The, our Russian partners did a terrific job of picking it up, but you don't want to be in that kind of situation. And it opens up other income streams, right? What are those? You guys talk about them every day here, right? It's advertising and tourism and, and different applications and things. So it's, it's uh, all very positive. And, I don't consider them debris. Uh, we found this out on ISS too. Is the guys like to be deployed from ISS, the CubeSats too, and that surprised me a little bit, but they like to be, to have a picture, right, a video of their CubeSat going out. These are usually schools, academia, maybe some small sat manufacturers. Uh, they like to have the astronaut involvement in it. It's just kind of a, a really cool thing. So if you have a choice and the cost is about the same, they'd rather go to ISS to, uh, to do that. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about STEM. The 43 million students is not uh, any kind of a misprint. I love the fact that Don Pettit even knows what Angry Birds is. That cracks me up. Uh, we got the spheres, so there's software competitions that the uh, students will do to, uh, to develop different software to actually move the spacecraft around. The YouTube Space Lab, uh, students are able to postulate theories and, and actually have things on ISS and, uh, and understand whether their, uh, their theories were correct or not. So STEM is a, is a big deal, and I think ISS plays a central role in it. Um, this is also, I think, a big deal. The uh, IGA, so I thought we were going to celebrate the IGA with the cake, right? Or the four MOUs that have basically since 1998, when they were signed, have provided the legal framework for the ISS and the partnership and have done a, a tremendous job because they're basically unchanged. And... Um, you know, U.S., Russia, ESA, Japan, Canada signed it. 
uh, and it provides usage guidelines, liability, uh, crew conduct, even commercial use is covered in, in that, uh, that framework. And why is that framework important? It's important because we can extend that framework, right? If we want to go do exploration, if we want to go do cislunar, if we want to go do lunar, if we want to go do Mars stuff with partners, we have the framework. Some extremely hard work was done. And the other piece is we learn to work together as national space programs. When I was on the NASA side, you could see that the, the ties between NASA and Roscosmos and JAXA and ESA and CSA are very, very strong. But also on the industry side, they're very strong. Uh, we talked to Alenia and Mitsubishi Heavy and Energia and Khrunchev and MDA, among many others. So we've built that relationship as well. And I think that helps the overall uh, space community. And we save money, right? We reduce the redundancy so we're not all working on the same thing. We're parsing out the work a little bit. Saves money overall and, and provides some standardization. All right. So I see my clock is starting to tick. So I talk to my kids about spheres of influence. And, and I like to think of it as there's really three. You have the suborbital sphere. You have the LEO sphere, and then you have the everything above that sphere, right? It'll probably be a cislunar sphere and then a Mars sphere, I think, in the future, right? Well, think about it. What does the government do in suborbital right now? Squat, right? Not much, right? Uh, they have left that almost wholly to the commercial side. And commercial is taking advantage of that. We've got programs, Virgin Galactic and, and XCOR and, and others are going to... to uh, dominate that market, but government's not involved other than some regulation stuff, right? What about LEO? So it's, it's purely commercial, right? LEO, what's LEO? LEO was just government, right? They were in the shuttle program. I know all about that, right? But we figured out LEO. LEO is not that hard to us. We understand the orbital mechanics very well. We understand crew health issues. We understand how to make a buck in LEO. We understand how LEO works. So now we're seeing that handover. It's, it was government. You're seeing ISS that is being transformed into more of a commercial platform. So that sphere is changing from wholly government to mostly commercial. And I think at some point, to reduce costs and spur innovation, that NASA and maybe some of the other governmental agencies will start to hand the daily operation of that over to contractors and, and allow us to reduce costs as NASA turns its focus on that third sphere which is the BEO piece, cislunar, Mars kind of stuff. But ISS is the focus for LEO. Um, I showed you the areas where we're, we're enabling technology development for exploration. I think that the near-term future, strong suborbital, start to phase over from LEO, from that government-led to commercial-led, and then we'll watch NASA do cislunar and Mars, and then I think the right focus is for that sphere to go into the commercial sector, right? So we, we build upon the same model over and over again, and that's where we get. I think that model is ISS. I think it's that focal point. It gives us our launches, and it gives us our capability to test and also do great research. Thank you all for your time. Well, we have questions. We have questions for you, John. No, I don't. Answer. You know, uh, you know, John. Uh, back when we used to do a lot of public speaking, the number one. You remember what the number one question they would ask you about space is? How do you go potty? How do you go to the potty? Now I am happy to tell you that this August crowd did not ask that question, I but they say, do want to do know. Demonstration later on. They do want to know about bo. So, what is, is there any work being done to improve the smell when the crews arrive? That is really funny. <laughs> Anybody going to volunteer? Put that they, yeah, they <laughs> asked that one. Well, actually, though, right, that's our siloxane problem because one of the big, big areas where we get the, uh, the siloxanes into the water system is through deodorant, which we're going to solve the siloxane problem, not solve the deodorant problem. Okay. So. What is the relationship between NASA Boeing and CASIS? Who decides what's tested? Yeah. Um, the, uh, well, I think Dwayne probably could answer this uh, even better, right? But uh, CASIS, this is a good deal, and I don't know if it really came out of the last discussion. Um, CASIS has a certain allocation of space on logistics flights that they are able to go out and give to people that want to go fly. 
Casus also has money that they've come together so that uh, they can go put seed money for the development of different payloads or research things. So think about that from the shuttle days to the ISS days now, right? I heartily apologize if you ever tried to put a payload on the shuttle, and you probably do too, right? Oh, man. It no. was a pain in the butt, right? It was really hard to do, a lot of safety reviews, a lot of different stuff. Look at it now. You can go to cases. They give you money. They pair you with somebody that knows how to develop hardware. Now you're on, the, on, the, on your own dime to be able to, 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 to uh, uh, build that hardware and test it, but they maybe even help you out a little bit there. And then you get a free ride to ISS. What a deal that is, right? So NASA, I think, has really seen the value of cases. They've really tried hard to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, enable what CASIS does because they're bringing non-traditional users into ISS. As far as the Boeing role, we try to support. We do a lot of integration on ISS. Uh, we do the sustaining engineering contract. Uh, we help CASIS, but it, it doesn't go a whole lot farther than, uh, farther than Questions? That's all we got. Oh, Thank you, John. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Don't tell stuff about the joke, okay? <laughs> That'd be good.